Good morning. I'm glad to be here with you. I was um, thinking about the Labor Day weekend and coming back and doing the second half of the Mother's Day message, and I thought, Mother's Day and Labor Day go together, don't they? I mean, after all, we mothers labor to become mothers, and then that's just the beginning of it, right? (laughs) So happy Labor Day weekend, and welcome to part two of our Mother's Day message. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online and those of you who are here at this campus and those who are now worshiping with us at our Hillcrest campus, I um, want to welcome all of you, and I want to give you a quick review for those who were here on Mother's Day, and a quick catch-up for those who might have missed the Mother's Day message. And as I do this, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles or on your electronic devices and look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Before I jump into that, I want to have a special welcome. Welcome to my mom and dad who are here today on Labor Day weekend, and I am very glad to have them with us today and worshiping with us, so thank y'all for being here up from Atlanta. They worship with us every Sunday on our online campus, so we're glad to have you here um, in person. All right, so just a quick recap. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we catch up with a king named Jehoshaphat, and if you were here for Mother's Day, we said, jumping Jehoshaphat. Winning spiritual battles is easy. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. He did a lot of great things. One of the things he did was give the scripture to the Levitical um, priest and send them out to all the cities so that the people would hear the reading of the word and begin to follow God's commandments. And while he was being good, an army amassed against him, and it was an army of the Moabites and the Ammonites, and the, there was another ites there with them, the Meonites, and they all got together and declared war on Jehoshaphat. And so when, in Second Chronicles, he finds out about this army, they're all coming and pressing in on him. And one thing you need to know about ancient times and warfare that happened during their time, those times is that the tactics of war were extremely barbaric. And one of the things that these kinds of wars would do is when the enemy came into your land, they would go from city to city and and take over, conquer each one. And one of the things that these guys were really good at, it was digging under the city walls so that the walls would fall and, and crumble down. And when they got to the city, they would take the city leaders and they would save them from their annihilation of that city only to take them to the next city and impale them outside the city gates of the next city in a way of saying, look what we did to your neighbors and what we're about to do to you. And when I got to thinking about how barbaric that was, I was a little bit reminded of what we've been watching in the news of the past several weeks. When we decided to, as Americans, to to pull out of Afghanistan and end this 20-year war on terrorism, we are seeing what barbarous warfare can look like. And while the Taliban had the perimeter that they were protecting around the airport, we're hearing now stories of the way that they were enforcing their perimeter. And for many people, they were being beat up. Some even limbs were being removed from their bodies and others executed. This was happening both in that perimeter and also at checkpoints throughout the country, even some people being plucked right out of their homes. So we today see a picture of what Jehoshaphat was facing in his day, these wicked armies. And he didn't think, though, about his own reputation or worry that he had to save face at a time like this. Instead, he was not afraid to admit his fear or his inadequacy or even his inevitable defeat apart from God's intervention. And we read his very honest assessment of the situation, and he said this, We are powerless. We don't know what to do, Lord, and we are looking to you for help. In part one, we learned six easy steps to winning these spiritual battles assembled together with other believers. Follow leaders who cry out to God. Praise God. Remember what God has done in the past. Gain perspective, recognize how this sits in the overall scheme of all that God's doing in the world. And then six, what what Jehoshaphat was just being, just be honest. And today I want to share with you what we can expect 
on our own battlefields when we pray like Jehoshaphat prayed. Father, I'm praying right now that you would just allow there not to be any distractions from hearing what this word that you have for us. God, we receive it. We right now just just put ourselves in a position of, of opening ourselves wide to receive the word that you have for all of us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. So number one, we can expect God to respond to our prayers. When we pray like Jehoshaphat led his people to pray, we can expect God to respond to our prayers. And if you're in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're picking up at verse 13. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, son of Mattaniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. What is beautiful about what happens here is when Jehoshaphat humbled himself and was just honest before the Lord, God chose to respond to Jehoshaphat's prayer with just an ordinary guy who showed up that day in the gathering. His name was Jehaziel. Who was this guy? The people obviously didn't know either because he comes with a resume that, get, that tells who his dad was, whose granddad was, whose grand great dad, and all the way back to the fact that he was a Levite descendant from Asaph. But get this. Do you know what his name means? Jehaziel's name means God sees. Which one of us is most likely to hear what God has to say? It would be the ones who spend the most time with him, the one that God sees on a daily basis, the ones who walk near enough to him to hear him whisper, because most often that's his favorite way of communicating, because you got to be, be nestled in close to hear a whisper. The one who knows that when we be still, he is God. And so when the one who's called God sees showed up in the assembly, he begged the people to listen to what God says. So number two is that we can expect God to give us a word. Look at verse 15. And Jehaziel said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a verse worth underlining. If you're um, opening up a print version of your scripture today, underline that verse. If you're on the Bible app, then highlight that verse. Put it on a pretty picture and post it out there on social media. This is an underline worthy verse. God's word to the people who were facing this mighty army is the same as his word to us today. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You got out of bed this morning, you dressed and came, or you didn't dress, you just showed up because you're watching online, and you came and assembled before the Lord because the Lord has a word for you with whatever battle you're facing. No matter what that battle is, no matter what circumstances are overwhelming you, I want you to hear Jehaziel's voice. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. What army, what mighty army are you facing? A desperate and dire medical report? Has COVID-19 taken its toll on you, your family, your friends? To be vaccinated or not to be vaccinated? Is this end of the war on terrorism with its tumultuous display of evil still rampant in Afghanistan taking a toll on you? And by the way, we did this in the first service, and I want to do it again in this service, and that is that I want to honor those among us who fought in the war on terrorism over the past 20 years. I honor you. We honor you. We honor you. 
We honor you for the sacrifice that you made. We honor you for the sacrifices that your family made. We honor you for the sacrifice that you continue to make because you served our nation with unselfishness and with bravery and with courage. And because of you, we have been able to live in the last 20 years without worrying about a terrorist attack on our land. Thank you. Thank you for your service to our country. What other armies are you facing? Does your spouse want a divorce? Has addiction had its death grip on you and you think there's no way out? Or do you know that your son or daughter is just slipping away from you? I don't care how big the army is or how powerful it seems, God is giving you his word this morning and it's not an accident that you're hearing it and this is what he says. Do not be overwhelmed by the size of that army or the strength of that enemy or the evidence of what you're seeing. Of course it's bigger than you and of course you are powerless against it and certainly you don't know what to do, but do not be afraid. What is fear anyway? Fear is a powerful emotional response to not what is, but what could be. It's an emotional response to what we project will happen because of what is. Fear finds its power in being unsure of what we hope for and certain of only what we can see. Fear is rooted in how we process a likely outcome. It's taking account of a situation and projecting the most likely conclusion based on our limited understanding and our seriously dis diminished thinking. It's us assuming what's going to happen because we've put our thinking skills to the task. When God commanded Jehoshaphat and all his people with do not be afraid, he challenged them to make a shift in their thinking. And the shift wasn't in the, in the legitimate and logical assessment of their situation, but rather in the ownership of the problem. Because they had assembled... And because they followed a leader who humbled himself before God, because they praised God in spite of the battle, and because they remembered his faithfulness in the past, and they put their situation in the larger context of God's plan, and because they got gut-level honest with God, God declared that he would make their cause his own cause, and the battle that had been theirs now belonged to the Lord. When we pray, God takes up our cause. He makes our problem his concern. This isn't your battle. My friends, this is not your battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. It's now his war. It's now his army to face, his day to save, his people to protect, his child to restore, his marriage to bring back, his test to endure, his victory to secure. You see, we release our fear by receiving God's willingness to take up your cause and make it his own. Replacing fear with faith is simply an exchange in ownership. And now that God is at the helm, faith rules. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that unlike fear that is sure of what we see and uncertain of what we hope for, faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. Do you want to know an absolutely necessary ingredient of faith? Humility. Humility that confesses, I got nothing. I know nothing. And I desperately need you, Lord. Number three, we can expect God to give us a plan. Look at verses 16 and 17. 
Tomorrow, this is Jehaziel still speaking for the Lord. March out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. You see, now that the battle belongs to the Lord, we have a new commander in chief. And it's a different battle plan and a whole different ball game. Jehaziel tells them what God wants them to do, and this is where it gets a little bit funny. This is where living the kingdom life can actually become hilarious. <laughs> Once we recognize that God's the one in control, we get to take the best seats in the house and simply watch him work. Through Jehaziel, God told them where the army would be marching. He gave specific instructions and where they could get the best view. What was their job? Simply just take a seat and stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Now, for some of us, that's not as easily, it's more easily said than done because we've been trained to fight. We've been trained to make strategies and plans. We've been trained to do things. We got ideas, and all God wants me to do is just be still and watch him work on my behalf. Not always is it like this, but many times God intends to fight for you while you keep silent. Daddy, it was actually you that gave me Exodus 14, 14 in one of the first battles we faced here at Thompson Station Church, and I thought I could go save the day with my eloquent argumentative skills out and across this community. My dad called me and said, Leanne, maybe you need to try Exodus 14, 14, and I said, I'm not sure what that says. He goes, well, it says the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. <laughs> there is much wisdom in this, in this verse. And Mama, I want to talk specifically to you right now. The battle belongs to the Lord. It's not yours. You don't even need to fight. God is inviting you to a front row seat. You march out against your enemy. You stand firm on your faith. You get yourself a good seat. And you watch the Lord's victory. Number four. We can expect God to invite us to respond. Verses 18 and 19. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. What a position of humility before the Lord God Almighty. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. And you know what I wrote? I write in my Bible, I highly recommend it. You don't, you don't cross out what God wrote. You just write your little notes along the way. And I wrote this, the party began. You see, they so received this word from the Lord that they knelt and let the truth of it just soak into them. And my friends, that I have always felt that way, that when we gather together on Sunday mornings, and, and I am I'm privileged to have an opportunity to speak speak in this place, but it is not, it is your pastors who get in here every single week and they deliver a word from the Lord and it comes to us for us to just soak in it and let it make its way into us to the joint and marrow of our bones. Let the word of God do its work. And I've always thought we shouldn't just rush out. We should like stand for a minute and just let the Holy Spirit settle it in our soul and begin to help us make the connection of what that word was to what his word is for me. And that's what we're going to invite you to do at the end of the service day, just to have a minute to just think on these things and make that exchange of your battle. But then what I love in the, in the midst of this is once they are humbly receive the word of God, they can't do anything but just party. Man, they just break out in a big, huge party because they have received the word of the Lord. They know the battle belongs to him. He's now in charge, and they are already celebrating the victory that is yet to be on this side. That is a demonstration of their great faith and confidence in God. So we need a party to the glory of the Lord when we get a word from the Lord. 
But mind you, this vast army from Edom is still marching toward Jerusalem. And so our story's not over yet. Number five, we can expect God to invite us to demonstrate our confidence in him through obedience to him. And this is exactly what they do. I'm picking up in verse 20. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. I wrote something else in my Bible. It's simply, believe, and you will succeed. And then after consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang, give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. You see, my friends, when we exchange our battlefield and we give it over to the Lord, our way of fighting is no longer strategy, no longer posturing, no more, no more manipulating, maneuvering, and trying to think, what do they think? What do we think? What can I do? What do None of that. Now our posture is to believe and then to sing. I love how he sent not snipers and not the Air Force, not any of that first. Who went before them were the singers. It was the praise team. It was the worshipers who went before. And then watch what happens. And this goes into our, our next point. And the, that point being that God invited them to demonstrate their confidence through obedience. And they demonstrated that confidence. Their faith was put to work with their feet. And this is what we can expect next. Number six, we can expect God to do what only he can do. At the very moment, verse 22, they began to sing and give praise. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. <laughs> so when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. And so when they got to the best spot in the house to see what was happening... They saw what happens when God takes on the battle. Total and complete annihilation of their enemy. Number seven, we can expect our battlefields to become valleys of blessings. Look at verse 25 through 26. So King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder they found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. And on the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It's still called the Valley of Blessing today. You see, my friends, every battle that comes our way gives us an opportunity to learn more about ourselves and to learn more about God. And my appeal to you today is if you will let God fight your battle for you, then your battlefield will become a valley of blessings. Your enemy will be defeated and you will be able to pick up the plunder. And you may say, well, what is the plunder? I don't understand. The plunder is the deep treasure of understanding the depths of God's love. There's nothing like going through the battle with the Lord to understand how much he loves us and how much he loves those who we're battling for. You'll also get a deeper understanding of yourself. We learn things about ourselves when push comes to shove, don't we? You'll get a richer experience with the community of faith. Can you imagine what it was like to experience this miracle together and what that did to their community? 
Actually, right before I said that, I glanced over here and Tammy is here today. Tammy Daniel, over from, back from the flood in Waverly. And we're so glad y'all are here. I see several of you here. And I have so watched, and I want to say this, our community of faith is strengthened when we see how the church, the body of Christ, and others have been responding hands-on, boots on the ground, just pouring out love in Waverly. And Tammy, you have been a great proclaimer of that throughout this whole ordeal. And we're so glad that you're here today and continue to pray for the recovery in Waverly. We experience these battles together. It builds our faith. And the confidence that comes, this is another plunder, when you trust God to do what you cannot do. And you may be sitting here and thinking, you know what, that was a great story in Second Chronicles chapter 20. But that was then and this is now. Well, I want to go back to Afghanistan. When the chaos in Afghanistan took front and center on the news, Christians from all over the world began to pray, didn't we? I know we were. We began to pray for people we did not know in a place we had never been because we felt the, the, the chaos and we felt the desperation. And in their world, they were facing a very similar, if not identical situation to what Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah were facing in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And now the stories are beginning to roll in about what has been going on in these evacuation efforts in Afghanistan. Miraculous evacuations amidst this chaotic departure of America's presence there. One of the coolest things that happened was not only did our armed forces go in and, and save and evacuate many, over 100,000 people in those few days we had to do that. But groups of veterans banded together and made their way into the war zone, rescuing tens of thousands more people who would not have been rescued had they not gone there. Now, let me tell you, and I'm just reading from a website called um, Task and Purpose. As the U.S. government scrambled to get Afghan allies and Americans out of Afghanistan after the Taliban took the capital of Kabul on August 15, groups of U.S. military veterans jumped into action to help evacuate vulnerable Afghans and American citizens still trapped in the city. The names of their operations ran the gamut. Pineapple Express, Team America, Save Our allies, Allied Airlift 21, to name a few. And listen to this part. The groups included more than just veterans. It also included former intelligence officials, diplomats, tech wizards, and everyday citizens who had the time and the conviction and the money. Many people gave hundreds of dollars to this effort, thousands, to lend a hand, pull, they, all these people together, pulled together to map evacuation routes, to help Afghans around Taliban checkpoints, and to coordinate with U.S. personnel on the ground to get people inside the airport. They had day jobs, but the rescue effort took priority for many of the veterans who spoke with task and purpose. A quote, people are working outside of their work hours. They're giving every moment they have, and you know we're just trying to do the right thing, said Alex, an Army combat veteran who worked with a group of veterans and officials who had previously served in Afghanistan. And I think for a lot of us, including me, having post-traumatic stress disorder for a number of years, this has been an opportunity to try to make something positive out of this situation and get some closure. I'm sharing this story to share this. And I want you to, as I'm sharing this, I want you to look at this picture of a father holding his little eight-day-old baby who got out of Afghanistan because of these efforts that were outside of the coordinated efforts, but they coincided and coordinated with the coordinated efforts. We prayed, church, the body of Christ all over the world began to pray for this crisis, and we had a mustard seed of faith, and God literally moved mountains of red tape, mountains of government process, mountains of opposing political views, and even religious affiliations. He united Americans with internationals and he saved lives thousands tens of thousands of lives God is the same today as he was when Jehoshaphat cried out to him in 2nd Chronicles chapter 20 and he'll be the same 
in your battles too. God has given you victory over the battles you're facing. He wants to make them his own. And my question to you today is, are you ready to give them to him? It's a simple exchange. Lord, my, my crisis into your capable hands. Father God, I choose to believe that you will do what I cannot and that this battle that I've been fighting, it now belongs to you. I will praise you with my church family as we follow the music and stand firm on the lookout point to celebrate the victory that we know you will give us. Oh God, we will collect the plunder and we will turn our ordinary battlefields into valleys of blessing. Whatever battle it is that you have been fighting, simply give it to the Lord. Let it be his. He has never confronted an enemy that he did not defeat. He has never shown up on a battlefield, wringing his hands and wondering what he could do next. The God that we served heard the prayers of his church and he assembled miraculously this, this high-tech, this intensely dangerous, this incredibly orchestrated, um, miraculous intervention during these last several days of this evacuation from Afghanistan. Father, we praise your name for what we have seen that you have already done. And we invite you to do it again on the platform of our lives today. Invite him in. Invite him in so that the God who does all of this globally can be the God who demonstrates all of who he is locally and personally as your prayer becomes, oh God, demonstrate your glory on the platform of my life. Be seen for who you are because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you for what only you can do. Amen. I want to invite you now just to, just to stand and think about that battle. And if you would be willing to make that exchange, we're going to have prayer partners here in the front, and maybe some will stand actually in the aisles. And it's just something solid about coming to somebody and saying, I'm giving this battle to the Lord, and be encouraged by their praying with you for that. And so come and do that as we sing. And if you don't want to come forward, but you want to give the battle to the Lord, you just turn with your spouse or with your family, or you just pray, just you and God, the Holy Spirit's right here, as close as he, he even closer than we know he is. And give that battle to the Lord. Aren't you tired of fighting it alone? Aren't you tired? He loves you so much. He always has. And he always will. And some of you may think, no, you don't know where I've been and what I've done, how I've profaned his name. Oh, yeah, I don't have to know. He knows. And he already knew that day when he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they were doing. He knew then. And he did that for now. He's the winner. He's the ultimate victor. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's sing and give it to him.